go ahead. Hi, my name is Mara Benjikji. I am a PhD candidate at Arizona State University, working with Jenny Patients, about to enter into my, enter into my final year, so keep an eye out for me if you're hiring. Um, so today I'm presenting on a couple of direct imaging surveys that I've been a part of. The first is the Companions to Be an A-Star Snapshot Survey, or CBAS. And for this one, we are looking for brown dwarf companions around being A stars to kind of quantify the occurrence rate of these objects and also try to get some more benchmark systems in order to better understand atmospheres of directly imaged systems. So we observed over 200 uh, being A stars with Keck a while ago, and I've been responsible for um, looking through the first EPIC data, finding candidates, and doing second EPIC observations to try and quantify the proper motions of these objects. And through that, we have so far found six bound M dwarfs no brown dwarfs, but not. there's still you know, optimism to be had. I still have a lot of um, second epic observations to conduct and some of the fainter companions to um, evaluate the astrometry for. So I'm also doing a survey of uh, binarity in Taurus, trying to finish off the um, companion search for objects in Taurus and get a complete survey of binarity in a star forming region. So I'm trying to finish off the survey for low mass objects um, using the LBT. Um, and Elmir cam uh, L band imaging. So we also have some ALMA data for these objects. So it's like a lot of cool information, um, understanding the companions and disc forming environments around uh, both high and low mass stars. So this is all my thesis work. If you have any questions or comments or you're interested to learn more about it, please find me at my poster number seven. I think that's my time. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amanda Chavez. I'm a second year PhD student at Northwestern University working with Jason Wong. Um, and my poster today covers the astrometric calibration um, for the Roman telescope um, coronagraph instrument. So if you are interested in the parts of Rob DeRose's talk that covered plate scale calculation and uh, finding celestial north angle, you should come check out my poster. Um, I don't remember what number, but it's it's purple like this. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Clarissa, I'm a fourth rising fifth year grad student at UC San Diego, and my poster is about orbits, which we heard quite a lot about this morning. So the idea here is that the eccentricities are directly niche companions. Uh, so planets and brown bears can tell us a little bit about how they formed. However, due to the very large separations of these companions, uh, the orbits tend to be very undersampled, and in turn, the eccentricity of the series can be biased or prone to changes once more data is added, or for example, which is the type of formula that we use. So we're on the left, you can see, and we're going to fit with a large family of orbits with a very front range of data. And on the right, you can see the changes in the electricity procedures, and once you change the proper power values, or once you add more information to your orbit fit. So uh, in this work, we use a new type of prior called the observable base prior, which aims to mitigate the biases that we have in the orbit fit to fulfill the orbits of 21 directly in which companions. And then we compare the population results for planets and world dwarfs to see if they were different, and also compare them to previous uh, orbit fits that use the traditional uniform parameter priors. And then finally, we simulated how much orbital coverage we need to uh, get the correct eccentricity procedures with any kind of prior. So if you're interested in orbits or priors, or eccentricity or all of the above, please come to my first slide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next one is joining us online. Oopsie, sorry. Uh, Akram, why don't you go? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm Ekrem, uh, recently started postdoc at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, my poster is titled Detecting Active Timing Variation Plans with Other Methods. So as you can see from number one, I'm going to have a brief introduction to ETV method, uh, which is based on the analysis of cyclic variations in the periods of eclipses of binary stars, so we can use them to detect certain binary planets. The method is quite efficient in terms of detection, as more than half of the current binary population were detected by by their ETVs. As you can see from the mass versus pre, uh, orbital period distribution at number two, the region inside the ellipse represents where the detections with ETVs as well as radial velocity or astrometry and imaging methods more or less overlap. 
So following that, we have this table at number three, where we calculated theoretical radial velocity amplitudes in red rectangle, angular separations in green, and transferables in blue rectangle of ETV planets. This transit method seems not possible for detecting these uh, planets due to very low transferability. Uh, radial velocity looks achievable, but requires decades long uh, follow-ups with large telescopes, so not so practical. The angular separations are typically less than 0 0.5 arc seconds, which adds some complexity to their detection with imaging. If we take a look to the contrast curve in number four, we have this huge question mark because we don't have the ages of these planets. Uh, which is a very complicated story. I'm not. Uh, I don't have enough time. Uh, so uh, we lack some information about their thermal emission. The reflected light should be around ten to eight to ten to uh, ten to minus eight to ten to minus ten. So we have to wait for some future uh, direct imaging telescopes like Habex or Roman to confirm them. So it's quite. It looks like a quite hard work. If you like to discuss how to confirm these plans with other methods, or if you are interested in plans in multistellar system, timing analysis, orbital dynamics, feel free to DM me on Slack or email me. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Lon, I'm a grad student at the University of Hawaii. And today I want to bring attention to why detectors matter for the Habitable World Observatory. Well, Sorry about that. How do we go back? <laughs> uh, you missed the question. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's mine. Okay, so um, over the last days, we had a good overview about uh, why it's important and it's challenging to get uh, low contrast, ultra low contrast. And uh, another thing that matters a lot uh, that was mentioned this morning by Sebastian is how uh, to get good signal to noise ratios in our observations. And in particular, Sebastian showed a cool plot about. Uh, an Earth-like exoplanet at 10 parsecs, uh, where you, you could see the PSF, and it was uh, something like 15 minutes to get a, like, um, you know, a kind of satisfying PSF uh, with high de detectability, uh, and that's for imaging. So if you want to do spectroscopy, you're gonna, you, you need to disperse all your photons, and you get to something uh, like a couple of photons per hour for one pixel, which is obviously super low. So at super low fluxes, you need super low noise as well. And so you need to really get some work done on detectors. And that's what we're doing in our group at the University of Hawaii. We have LMAPDs, which stands for Linear Mode Avalanche for the Dots. So these are super low noise detectors. They also have their special characters. So it's really fun and interesting devices to work on. So yeah, please come talk to me to see my poster. Thank you. So, hello. So, uh, yesterday, Faustine presented the path processing algorithm for uh, ADI in high contrast imaging. So, my, my parser is about combining ADI with another strategy, RDI. Uh, so, uh, to do that, I use the uh, IPCA algorithm, iterative principal component uh, analysis. So, among the huge number of post-processing algorithms that exist, uh, I like and would recommend IPCA because uh, it's a great compromise. Like it's uh, simple, easy to use, and it's perfectly efficient at um, not having uh, the over-subtraction effect. Uh, and so with this so powerful algorithm and combining uh, two observing strategy uh, to um, avoid uh, the enormous limitation of uh, each individual of, uh, of them. So this is the top plot. It's all IPCA, but we like on synthetic this, but it's different uh, strategy, like individual or combined. Uh, and the bottom plot is what we can do uh, with this method on a real protoplanetary disk. So yeah, you can look at my poster if you're interested. Hello everyone, my name is Rachel Kotari and I'm a graduate student at the University of Toledo in Ohio. Uh, and the title of my poster is Probing the Heights and Depths of ultra Cool Objects, Atmospheric Retrievals in the Era of JWST. Uh, in my poster, I present two types of comparative results, uh, one of which is uh, showcasing how broad wavelength coverage uh, helps us constrain the retrieved or 
the model results uh, compared to the narrow wavelength uh, coverage. Uh, also, the other comparison I make is between the retreat and the forward models, uh, showcasing uh, how forward models and the retreat models disagree. Uh, also, uh, we did a further analysis of the, say, disagreement and found that more work needs to be done in forward models uh, to make them match the, uh, you know, the observed results. Also, uh, with the broad wavelength uh, coverage uh, from JWST, we are able to constrain all the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen bearing molecules. Uh, and because of that, we are able to constrain the abundances of those molecules with a higher precision than before. Uh, so if you would like to talk about uh, how we are able to constrain or how, how much better can we do with uh, JWST uh, or how uh, the four models and the retreat models disagree from each other, please come and talk to me. I'm more than happy to talk about it. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Dushinta Kumar. I'm a rising junior undergrad from Penn State. So my, res my research is on exploring uh, superpowers and specifically I'm looking at the target TRI-3757B. Oh, I said that twice. Uh, and uh, what exactly are superpuffs? So superpuffs, uh, like the name suggests, are exopuffs with really puffy atmospheres. And they're very unusual because they have masses less than 0 0.3 Jupiter, uh, Jupiter masses, but uniquely like Jupiter-sized, which is very unusual. So... Uh, we, nobody knows how these are found. Uh, so we look at uh, the atmospheric uh, part of things. So uh, I look at uh, the interior temperature and how it affects the atmosphere of superpuffs. So I specifically look at methane abundances in the uh, atmosphere and how it changes with different interior temperatures of the exoplanet. And uh, that is my... Uh, plot that I generated using the atmospheric models uh, using Picasso. So if you're interested to know more about superpowers or know more about my atmospheric models, please come check out my poster. Thank you. Hi, I'm Elena Mamonova. I'm a PhD fellow with uh, Center for Planetary Habitability of University in Oslo. And my project is about flare model to study exoplanet atmospheres. So NWORS uh, preferential targets to finding uh, habitable planets because they have a, a close habitable zone. And uh, detection methods uh, prefer uh, small planets detection around NWORS, but NWORS are uh, very highly active and frequently produce flares which is uh, outburst of energy across the whole spectra. And uh, um, it's especially uh, important for the exoplanetary atmospheres because um, NWARS are uh, mostly red in spectra, but flares produce uh, a lot of X-ray and um, uh, ultraviolet, uh, and it could uh, affect atmosphere uh, of exoplanet at great extent. But uh, the problem is uh, um, uh, uh, flares actually is uh, very complicated, both in spectrally and temporally uh, domains. Uh, and uh, we uh, have uh, very few observations in the very interesting uh, range of spectra, as, uh, as I said, uh, X-rays and uh, uh, UV. So we propose a model uh, of, uh, of the flare based on uh, a uh, grid of uh, radian uh, atmosf uh, atmospheres of uh, end wars during the flare event. Uh, we could, uh, from this model, based on the physical principles that are happening, uh, what the processes that are happening in the uh, stellar atmosphere during the uh, flare, uh, namely the uh, Electron beam uh, propagates uh, down, downwards and uh, brightens the atmosphere of uh, Antwerp. We can retrieve uh, uh, surface, uh, uh, surface flux uh, from the star. And then uh, we just need to uh, account for how frequently we have these flares. And we look into uh, 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 the uh, temporal uh, distribution of the flares using uh, young moving groups. If you're interested in this, just uh, come by my posture and ask me other questions. Thank you.
Hi, um, my name is Yasser. I'm from University of Turku, Finland. Uh, I'm studying hot Jupiters with optical polarization. And uh, what we do is that we observe uh, optical polarization in different passbands, and then we try to analyze the data by studying variation in Stokes Q and U in BVR passbands in this case. And as you can see on the periodogram, we do uh, th there's this one peak around 2.3 uh, uh, days, which is actually uh, the non-orbital pe uh, period of epsilon uh, Andromeda B here. So what we see here is that uh, from our data, we can see that the signal is there. However, uh, uh, when I try to analyze it, it turns out the uh, orbital param parameters don't make much sense since uh, in case of noisy data, the inclination would be close to 90 degrees, uh, which in case of this planet, which is a non-transiting exoplanet, it shouldn't be that close to 90 degrees. So what we can say at this point is that data is very noisy and uh, it cannot be modeled. However, uh, we will have access to a bigger telescope later this year and Hopefully these results will improve. Uh, will improve. Uh, please come and have a discussion with me uh, if you would like to know more about it. Thank you. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Jorge. I am a grad student at ASU, and uh, my work focuses on studying the differential abundance analysis between uh, brown dwarfs and binary pairs. Now, why should you care about that? We heard this week about how the CDOs and metallicities of planets uh, can be diagnostic of the formation uh, and migration uh, location, and in particular, that from third function, planets should differ in CDO and metallicity from their host star. Now, if you compare that to other binary systems like binary stars, those are thought to have closer CDOs and metallicities uh, to each other, given the fact that they're forming from the same molecular cloud. If you bring that total system mass uh, all the way down, say if you look at uh, pairs of brown dwarfs, uh, the differential abundances between those objects aren't as well understood just because there aren't as many of those pairs uh, out there. They're not as well studied. And so my work focuses on trying to understand the dispersion in uh, brown dwarf binary pairs uh, to uh, measure if any, uh, if there any dispersion exists between them. Uh, it's particularly for the coolest brown dwarfs, uh, late T and early Y dwarfs. So if you're interested in finding out the answer to that, come by poster 40. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jamila Taki, and I'm starting a postdoc at the University of Michigan. And I'm going to talk about my uh, poster on Pi Star Shade which is a Python tool that I've developed to perform end-to-end -end optical simulations of star shades. Um, so a star shade is an external occulter which flies in free formation with a telescope as opposed to a coronagraph, which is an internal occulter. And modeling star shades is really difficult because star shades are very large but need a very fine spatial sampling in order to accurately perform optical calculations and reach down to the 10 to the minus 10 contrast level. Um, and also these calculations need to be performed in the Fresnel regime. So in my work, I use a um, FFT based technique called a Bluestein FFT, which can be used to indirectly, uh, via indirectly using FFTs, you can compute arbitrary samples of a Fourier spectrum um, without the need for large zero padding factors, which are typically needed with direct FFTs, and with more efficiency than direct um, DFT computations. So the point of this tool is to be able to uh, assess the star shade imaging performance with respect to aspects of an astrophysical scene. And so I've done two case studies um, which I won't talk more about because I'm at the end of my time. The first being the stellar diameter. And then I've also looked at using uh, simulated scenes simulated with the Exo Vista tool by Chris Stark and Alex Ho. And um, come talk to me if you want to hear more. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Ruben. I'm a PhD student at the University of Bern in Switzerland. And I work on the Placid Coronagraph, 
which um, is the world's first SLM based active high contrast is instrument. So basically it uses a spatial light modulator in place of a classical uh, focal plane mask. Um, so a spatial light modulator basically consists of liquid crystals that can um, basically locally delay the optical path or the phase of the incoming starlight. So basically this looks like a detector, but it has, and it has pixels and the light gets, uh, the starlight gets uh, destructively interfered. Um, the, the cool thing about this is that any phase pattern can be basically programmed onto the spatial light modulator. So you can uh, program any kind of vortex uh, phase mask that you can imagine with any kind of charge, for example, or a rodier mask or whatever. And it can adapt to observing conditions in real time. So, for example, you can calibrate for non-common path aberrations. And um, yeah, and then another cool thing is that uh, we're trying to do multiple star coronagraphy. So you can basically program a binary uh, vortex, as you can see in the image there. So you can basically uh, probe uh, circumbinary disks or planets or something like that um, with uh, such a vortex. Um, and yeah, this instrument will be installed this year at the DAC telescope in Eastern Turkey. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have first light by beginning of next year. Um, so thanks. If you're interested in uh, talking to this, uh, talking to me about this, please come to my poster. Thank you. And the next three poster pops is going to be remote. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, I am Dimari Paul from the Department of Space and Civil Institute of Fixed Analytics and Award Pakistan. I am present the paper to an economic problem of the planet to the right 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 to the revolution army with Pan 8 motor telescope are patents checking the rest of the army are very fast. The spray time per mode of the parts in 16 seconds per mode, 13 seconds per hour, 16 seconds per hour, and then passes 10 seconds. The revolution routine is in the middle of one. The production of the time to the revolution was performed by the agency of state making and the direction software. The difference in the company has obtained an astral energy. We were on that side of the way to show a target and comparison star and have seen the current and the image on the right side is their light cut. Have we passed over our most far light for modern specific design for this perfect? The figure theory show a modern photo light curve with me and our band pass is over the data of first and fifth July. The parameter of one two systems are drives than the best fitted model over the light cut, which are given in table two. The results are consistent with the previous work of Brain and Audio Probe. However, the right inclination angle and some of your access to a stellar radius is slightly larger. We highly recommend the further observation of the target format and the QTE analysis, but also for defining the parameter of the mental system. Hello, I'm Dr. Uh, this in time when the driver's variable is the tree bearing algorithms. You're interested in these tree algorithms because they are analogs for directly energy exoplanets, these algorithms, such as beta, which are B. And I'm interested in finding out what causes the variable in these objects. And if you look at my poster, I'll be able to explain that a bit and explain what we hope to do in the future and find out whether it's using clouds or whether it's other magnetic spots. So if you have any questions, just drop me an email. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Kayla Smith. I am a research assistant here at Caltech and a rising graduate student at the University of Arizona. Considering that this Sagan Summer Workshop is currently about direct imaging of exoplanets, I would like to talk to you about how we further characterize those exoplanets as potentially being Earth-like. This is the paper that we just published this year entitled The Process We Call Earth, Relationships Between Dynamic Feedbacks and the Search for Guidance Signatures in a New Paradigm of Earth-likeness. Here are all the amazing authors on this work, and there's the QR code if you want to check out the paper. The entire thesis of this paper is reconceptualizing what it means for a planet to be Earth-like. To do that, we have to define what Earth-likeness is. 
We define it as a network of dynamically persi persistent biogeochemical systems. Gaia signatures are signatures or signs of a biosphere coupling with the geosphere in a dynamically persistent fashion. If you look at the figure to the right, you can see that some of the main chemical cycles that occur on Earth make up the internal mutual feedback communication between cycles of the planet and are mutually persistent through time. We also want to categorize this work as a process-based framework in which the rhythm of the planetary body has a sense of relationality within itself and its surroundings. We also challenge dominant and materialistic worldviews and argue that we must become intentional with our relationship with nature. So thank you so much.